much. Morning. Morning. So, 1996 was a very formative year for me. First of all, it was my senior year of high school and it started off the exact perfect way for the 80s teen movie, a cheerleader ran me over with her car. <laughs> this meant that I missed two weeks of school, which meant that I missed the very large all-school assembly from a famous business leader whose name I've completely forgotten, where he told us that unless we started to major more students in science, technology, engineering, and math fields, we were at risk of losing America's innovative edge to China, I believe it was. Of course, this was kind of funny because three days later I was issued my first email address. I've also since long forgotten that, which is kind of a shame. We fast forward a little bit, we get to October 2002. In October 2002, Robert Gordon of Northwestern University wrote a very landmark study where he said that unless we started to graduate more students from science, technology, engineering, and math fields, that we were at risk of losing our innovative edge to India this time. And then, of course, just a couple of weeks ago, well, no, sorry, in October 2002 as well, Zonga was the most popular website on the internet with, I believe, up to two million page views. Zonga, of course, gave way to MySpace, gave way to Facebook, gave way to Twitter, and social media was born, and once again, no one ever really noticed. And so just a couple of weeks ago, we saw that with the cuttings of technological education programs, we were at risk of losing our technological innovative edge to, I don't even remember this time, but it's kind of all the same story. So my <laughs> contention to you guys is this. What if they're wrong? What if we're not at risk of losing our innovative edge, but it's simply becoming more developed for us in different angles? What if we're having the perfect collision of DIY with internet culture with instant skill sets? Is that gonna catch fire again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, first we have to start by looking at internet culture. Push the button. There you go. That button. No, no, that button, that button. That button. <laughs> That was worth waiting for. <laughs> of course, internet culture isn't just all lolcats. What's been an interesting development in the last couple of years is that the entirety of human knowledge, every single fact you could ever possibly want to know, has been indexed, categorized, and made perfectly available to you instantly in real time. What was once 15 years ago, a major university research library has now become a smartphone. The, every single possible fact you could ever want to know has been completely indexed and filed for you, and you don't have to go ask the librarian where the microfiche is kept. The change that this has developed in itself is very transformative. I don't know anything about, say, platypus venom, but I could in just a couple of <laughs> seconds. And this isn't just, you know, smart people who do technology. Next time you've got a dinner party of more than four people, ask when election day is. It won't be 30 seconds before somebody pulls out their smartphone and starts to look at it because our desire to learn and our desire to be correct is better than our desire to figure it out for ourselves. <laughs> That being said, the perfect timing of this vast array of knowledge is also colliding with a new resurgence called the maker movement. What we're really learning is that the do-it-yourself culture, which used to be Home Depot and building sheds, is now truly becoming do-it-yourself. You can learn any possible skill you could ever possibly want. But hold on to that thought for a second, because first we have to talk about Julia Child and Led Zeppelin. <laughs> the... Hmm. I have seem to have completely lost my place. So let's go ahead and hit the next slide anyway. <laughs> what we need to remember is that uh, internet learning and distance learning used to be solely the reservation of universities, such as Queen's University, such as the University of Phoenix, such as you know, long distance, university, very bookish, very, very limited skill sets. However, what's happened recently is that with the development of YouTube and the instant availability of web forms on any topic, is that any possible thing you could want to program or want to learn is being made available for you. And we have to thank this lady, Julia Child. Julia Child, while not having the first cooking show on television, had one of the best and the most landmark. With Julia Child's cameras in Julia Child's kitchens, you could watch Julia Child teach you the basics of learning how to cook. Julia Child turned out to be so famous that she gave way to Jacques Pepin. Jacques Pepin turned out to be so famous he gave way to Martin Yen, and so on and so forth. And the explosion of cooking shows is really where I think we can look at the start of our internet-based, video-based learning. For example, if you wanted to learn pizza crust, you wouldn't necessarily have to go get the textbook or find out about it. You could just make pizza crust. When you watch a cooking show, you are watching an absolute master of their craft do the absolute best job they could possibly could. Hollywood enhanced in live digital right in your TV set, and nobody knows if you burn the butter but you, which is an important development. So, it's not just cooking shows, however. We make a big deal out of Salman Khan and Khan Academy because Khan Academy is revolutionizing the way we teach mathematics. However, it's not just Khan Academy. We are rapidly developing Khan Academy for everything. As my contention for this point, here's eight people learning to play Stairway to Heaven. And the real big question is, do I press play? 
I'm just messing with you guys. I couldn't get the sound to come together. In any case, <laughs> everyone has learned how to play guitar, but the number of guitar teachers in the world hasn't multiplied at all. And of course, we're not just talking about guitars. There are recent reports that the Libyan rebels in a recent revolution learned to fire the Orlikan 20 millimeter anti-aircraft cannon by watching YouTube videos of the Mujahideen resist the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Now, the question you have to ask yourselves is, well, what if I'm kind of okay with how my pizza turns out, I'm good with my government, but I'd rather learn a new manufacturing skill or learn a particular new piece of technology? Well, if you want to learn how to program a microcontroller, previously it was about six weeks of night school at a community college and somewhere around $1,200. And that was really the only way you could learn these hands-on skills. What we have now are places called hackerspaces. A hackerspace is a technological group lab where people who are interested in learning how a particular skill set or a particular technology works all come together in one unified area to teach each other. It's kind of like dabbling in your garage, except you all have the same garage and you have no idea what the other guy is doing. Some of you may be familiar with my alma mater, Hackerspace Charlotte, here, right here in the Noda district of Charlotte. Hackerspace Charlotte recently won the great global hackerspace competition with our educational device called Peltronics, and you may have heard just last week we finished painting the world's largest QR code on a rooftop in Noda. You'll be able to see it from the airport as you're flying in, have your phones ready. So in a hackerspace, all you have to do is say, would anybody like to teach me how to do circuit theory, or I want to weld, or my personal favorite, I broke my computer. So, <laughs> and these skill sets are readily available. Somebody will come out and say, well, here you go, here's how that works. There are 500 hackerspaces in the world. So just in the last couple of years, the proliferation of this availability of skill set has become rapidly available to us, which is all very nice. As a new a particular indicator of something that we're working on in hackerspaces, this picture was taken from a Hughes Aerospace Orb U2 satellite, total cost to you $57 million. This picture was taken by eight guys from Hack DC, the Hack Washington DC hackerspace, total cost $320 and lunch for the guy who drove. <laughs> and while we're talking about particular technologies that are being played with in hackerspaces, over here we have what's called a, a Persa Mendel and a MakerBot. These are the first generation of really the home hobbyist 3D plastic printers. Essentially, in doing the concept absolutely no justice at all, it's an inkjet printer that moves the nozzle around, except it prints in plastic and it's printed in three directions. What this is doing is it's revolutionizing personal manufacturing in that any possible thing you could want to design, you just go ahead, draw it out, you print it up, nothing to it. However, like many things in technology, everything gets smaller, better, faster, and cheaper. In 1986, a 3D printer caused the exact same as a 1986 BMW 320i with the sunroof and the leather interior. <laughs> now, they were cheaper than an iPad and rapidly getting cheaper. Of course, it's not just all technology and learning how to use technology. It's also cuteoverload.com. <laughs> not necessarily cuteoverload.com. What we're also learning with the internet is that the very methods of invention are becoming susceptible to the changes in innovation. We all know who Bill Gates is and what he's done for us. We all know who Mark Zuckerberg is and what he's done for us. And some of the quicker among us will recognize Bree Predis, who is one of the inventors of the MakerBot from a hackerspace in Brooklyn. However, we don't know who Taco Wheat is. <laughs> We've also never heard of Hirohito Kozawa. And we completely have no idea who Erica Jost is. However, these are three of the 1,744 people who wrote your Firefox internet browser. These people have never met, and even fewer of them have ever been paid. However, they are developing technology in such a way that is rapidly changing the way we live. And it's not just, it's not just Firefox. What's happening is we are turning out to live in the future. The rapid proliferation of knowledge is colliding with the rapid proliferation of skills, is colliding with new manufacturing techniques, and rapidly changing the way we live. Personal manufacturing has been talked about wrapping up, wrapping up, all right. Personal, <laughs> personal technology is rapidly revolutionizing the way we live. Let's go ahead and have a look at what history says about this. In 1903, an editorial ran in the New York Times, and the particular bit in the middle says that the flying machine which might actually fly might be assumed to exist in one to 10 million years, which is what the absolute finest minds of the time thought. On the very same day, October 9th, 1903, Orville Wright wrote in his diary in Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, we unpack goods for new machine. This rapid transformation is happening at the same point right under our foot in places called hackerspaces. Hackerspaces are a bunch of smart guys working in small rooms on machines you've never heard of.
If I have seen further than others, it is because I am standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> Bernard of Chartres wrote that 800 years ago, and we're still saying it today. Innovation, ideas, and technology are coming together to mean that we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. We have all of their knowledge, all of their skills, and they're leaving us their tools. Thank you very much. We gonna land that? <laughs> I guess we should land it. It lands, right? <laughs> we, only, we only practice takeoff. That's all we. Uh... How many of you want one? <laughs> By the way, I should point out, in 1986, the Department of Defense spent 87 million dollars to develop this. Nowadays, 400 dollars. We're living in the future.